Bill, for this very rich uh, presentation. Maybe you can switch. I, I think you switch off your video. We could see your video. So maybe you can switch on your video. Yeah. Bill. yeah. yeah. Fine. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think also all the students will switch on their video. Um, we have now three discussants. We have uh, Malena, uh, we have uh, um, Juan Manuel and Quentin. Uh, I leave you take the floor and share your, your screen. Perfect. Okay. Leo is not alone. Uh, okay, you start first. I will pin the video. Okay. Okay. So first of all, um, I mean, tell me if my mic, if everything is working okay. Um, first of all, we would like to thank uh, Professor Lansonic for for his interesting presentation. And now we are going to start the second part of this uh, joint seminar session. We decided, or we are going to 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 divide the remain, remaining time that we have in three slots. First, uh, we will discuss what we think are the core concepts uh, that Professor Lansonic uh, developed through his work. Secondly, uh, we will try to linger upon some of uh, these topics and key issues and that we will also like to discuss with him. And finally, there will be um, a slot for questions from the audience. But um, before getting deeper into the main uh, concepts, we believe that it's necessary or it's nice to give a framework or a bigger picture of where we can find um, Lansonic's work particularly because the paper is very interesting, interesting in the sense that it not only presents like an empirical basis of uh, the changes that US uh, enterprises went through and its implications for society, but at the same time, it has a clear theoretical framework of how companies allocate productive resources, how actors contribute to these, uh, to production and how these can render different uh, regimes. So therefore, we would like to interpret the text in the light of corporate governance uh, literature, and more interesting, interestingly, between the intersection of two streams of thought that deal with a super relevant and necessary question, and that is, uh, what is the role of the firm in society? And as he mentioned, on the one hand, we have the shareholder value uh, ideology more ligated to mainstream economics, where companies uh, solely are worried about maximizing profits and share value. And on the other, we have a more comprehensive uh, perspective introduced by Burr, that is the corporate social responsibility, where companies are more than profiting units and have a responsibility towards society and can act as catalysts uh, for fair wages and job security and stability, among others. Uh, so having said and having introduced this bigger uh, framework, I'll give the floor to Quinton. Here we go. So <clears throat> first let's talk about innovation because the uh, because that's what the article is about. The article is concerned about rising inequalities and the dynamic dynamics of LinkedIn studies. Prosperity is here defined as a characteristic of an economy whose growth is stable and benefiting a large middle class. And the question is, where did prosperity go? How to get it back? And the answer for uh, Lazenik is growth led prosperity will only be secured with an effective innovation strategy. And as in many other contemporary growth paradigms, uh, you consider that growth avenues lay along the lines of intensive growth, that is productivity increase, Innovation, though here is defined, innovation is defined as generation of higher quality and lower cost products and services, requiring a more efficient combination of capital, capital and labor. Nevertheless, here, innovation does not belong only in the company, but throughout society. The innovation triad has three pillars, and all of them are essential. First, the innovative enterprise, of course, the investor in productive capabilities and the actor of innovation. These business firms are key actors of innovation, putting money at risk for transforming 
a technological change into a commercial opportunity? Since investment is uncertain, collective and cumulative, the firms need to orient their strategy control, organizational integration and com financial commitment towards innovation. They all need to be dedicated to foster innovation on the long run to, su to, to sustain prosperity. Yet they rely on and make use of the productive capabilities provided by both household units and government agencies. Household units indeed provide productive capabilities in the form of young workers trained into productive adults. Investing in international intergenerational human capital, personal and often film specific knowledge and homes as physical infrastructures prone to reproduce the workforce. As does they are supportive families. And the, the last actor are government, government agencies. They have, who have to take the role of the development state with massive investment in fundamental research and physical infrastructures. But the article deplores that the recent investment policy of the Biden government fails to account for this triad and only supports investment for governmental agencies and household units. In the US, the innovative enterprise is no longer and should be made alive and well again. And now I look for one more. Okay, um, and now we wanted to highlight um, the analysis that Professor Lassanik does about the different resource allocation regimes, specifically for the US economy. Uh, first, um, the retain and reinvest regime was enforced in the US from the 1940s to the 1970s. And, and this regime entailed um, the retention of profits from major corporations and the reinvestment of them in productive capabilities, including the ones uh, from the labor force. Since the 1990s, a new resource allocation regime was predominant, and that's a uh, Professor Lansonic uh, calls it downsize and distribute. And this implied the layoff of more experienced workers and also uh, the ending of the one company career concept in a sense in many of the biggest corporations. And this was made along a, a predatory value extraction process of massive distribution of profits uh, that uh, they uh, uh, loot the, the US business corporation. And um, also during this time, uh, when the downsize and distribution regime uh, was enforced, employment relations experienced major changes. Uh, there were rationalization, marketization, and globalization. Uh, and all these cut uh, cost cut uh, strategies uh, of the biggest corporations uh, were instead of investing um, to reposition their organizations uh, and producing not a product, they released cash, uh, which was distributed to shareholders. The um, maximized shareholder value view was the ideological legitimation uh, of this uh, shift to the downsides and distribution regime with economic efficiency as one of the arguments. Um, this led to extreme concentration of income, the erosion of middle class, uh, employment opportunities and also falling uh, productivity in many of these corporations. Uh, the practice of open market share repurchases that we will call stock buybacks um, ha have been a central instrument for the shift to the downsize and distribution regime and the primacy of the maximized shareholder view. Uh, please change. Yeah, so Stock back, buybacks, as Professor already told, were, um, became central after the promulgation of this uh, Rule 10B18 by the Securities and Exchange Commission of the US. And this rule somehow encouraged stock market manipulation strategies, allowing companies to um, do open market repurchases for the mainly purpose of giving manipulated boosts to their stock prices. Uh, this behavior was also fueled by the spread of stock-based remuneration schemes for senior executives. 
and uh, who, who, while they were maximized in shareholder value, they were also uh, increasing their own income. Um, the paper gives uh, several examples of uh, the ongoing tensions between innovation and financialization, uh, with the statement, really clear statements of top executives. Uh, but a very important and interesting part for us uh, of the paper are the policy recommendations. What to do to, to change the present situation and get out of this downsize and distribute allocation regime, uh, enhancing the investment triad uh, to work properly and re returning to a sustainable prosperity path. So to make just a really quick summary, because uh, they were already mentioned, uh, Professor Nansenik proposed to ban the stock buybacks uh, to avoid even the financialization of non-financial firms and promote the investment in productive capabilities. Also give in uh, incentives to uh, top executives for value creation instead of uh, value extraction, turning the reward scheme into one uh, that rewards company growth and innovation. Um, also create more democratic corporate boards, including the views of workers and taxpayers, uh, and therefore including representatives of the other members of the investment triad. Reforming the tax system uh, to support in the investment triad, innovation and value creation. And finally, uh, support uh, these processes of collective and uh, cumulative careers for households with government taxes and corporate profits. <laughs> enable a social upward mobility. And precisely that on this point of social mobility, I would like to, to begin the discussion. Uh, so at our first reading of the text, one thing that struck us was the allowed on sustainable prosperity and its definition as growth allowed and increasing standard of living for an ever expanding middle class. We thought that the poor, the working class was thus excluded from this prosperity model, that anyways in democracy, the majority and its interests rule, and here it is the middle class. Then we started to consider this proposition as a proposal for an equalization of chances, not of situations, a kind of revival of the American dream. Everyone should be able to move up the social ladder and get a comfortable middle class life. The working class are not ignored and excluded in this model, though given the chance. But our first impression never left us, though, and we started to think about which labor we were talking about. We were talking about workers staying in a company for a long time, investing in firm specific human capital. As the article says, investment in productive resources entails training and retaining employees, and policy recommendations are higher pay more employment security, superior benefits, and more interesting work, which sounds great. Wait. Ooh. But this reminded us of an old, but nowadays trendy concept, internal labor markets. We recognized this concept for Pure and Doringer in an article of 1971. They developed the conception of the firm as an internal labor market. Each firm designs their own administrative labor rules and incentive mechanisms to establish long-term employment relations, benefiting everyone, the employee and the employer. Everyone, not for you. So in Doringo, I present a bigger picture. Internal labor markets are part of a primary labor market where good working conditions rhyme with high wages and promotions. Opposed to it is the secondary market, offering low wage labor of poor quality and high turnover, often precarious, short term and with non traditional working schedule, these jobs are devoted to a part of society who has no choice because it has no property and often little education. These working classes are not prosperous and they have little chance to be. Since capitalist economic growth is rooted in exploitation of workers, nature, the global south and the organized, unrecognized and mostly female care work, how can we aim, especially in the higher, like the richest country in the world to increase the standards of living. So my question for you is what's your definition of the middle class and what do you make of the exploited? Okay, uh, 
Am I supposed to respond now or? Did yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm talking about a dynamic process of social mobility. And on the one side of people rising, uh, uh, often in working class jobs to be uh, to a middle class standard of living. Uh, and I'm also talking about a very uh, broad definition of the term middle class in terms of uh, people who uh, different levels of education uh, have uh, enough to get by, can, can, but also have the uh, uh, wherewithal to um, uh, for intergenerational upward social mobility. Now to this, uh, I mean, I, I'll refer you to a series of papers, which is coming out of a book as a book, which is on the INET website, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, on uh, what had happened to African-American employment over the last 50 years. And uh, some of the things you said were just now were relevant to, to it. Uh, uh, in uh, the 19, uh, as a right, the result of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, they created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And the uh, initial article we wrote on this, we called it the Equal Opportunity Employment Omission. Because what it was assumed when they said uh, uh, that there would be equal employment opportunity was in fact the notion of a career with one company except within major companies, uh, African-Americans instead had been kept in the lowest skilled jobs and uh, often in, in relationships where they're outside the unions. And what happened in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, that there was upward mobility uh, within these companies, uh, particularly to semi-skilled jobs, the auto work industry would be one of them, uh, where and steel industry, uh, uh, machinery manufacturing, where a large number of African-Americans were able through internal mobility in the company, uh, which was a result of two things. One was uh, um, the fact that the white working class intergenerationally was upward mobility, getting free education for their children and moving into college educated white collar jobs. Uh, and the fact that you have the affirmative action and a, a really a third factor is that there was very little immigration in the 1960s and uh, started in the 1970s. So, so there was a huge demand, well, well there was still a big demand for uh, blue collar labor. Now, uh, at that point, point uh, you know, you could say that the blue collar semi skilled worker in the United States uh, was in some ways exploited. Every worker somewhere is exploited. I even felt exploited in some points as a, as a university professor, but we have different amounts of ways of dealing with that. Uh, you know, if you have a boss, you're likely at some point to feel exploited sometimes, but you may really be exploited. But the exploitation was reduced. And in fact, standards of living were achieved for people which uh, were gave them a lot of security. Because one of the things you got, and this is in the American context, was you also got your health care covered, you got your uh, fine benefit pension. It's, it's one of the reasons why health care is so bad in the United States is that uh, it, the big corporations used to cover it. And it originated as a white man's you know, world as for white working class, but Blacks started getting access uh, to this as well. Okay, so we talk about the Blacks emerging middle class among those blue collar blacks. Now they're different than the emerging middle class, whether white, black, or man, or whatever, uh, who have uh, um, uh, college educations, but they are moving uh, uh, up the ladder in the companies and uh, uh, getting, and that was the way they got access to these. That was much less through the, the labor market. Now, I just one thing is I, I always say to people, don't use the term internal labor market. It's an internal job structure because it's not a market. So it really, whenever people talk about the market, you know, it, it, it's it's uh, they know who the people are. They they have uh, control over the promotion and hiring. The market is something where you just hire and fire people in, uh, anonymously. Um, but in any case, that's a semantic thing. So I would call it internal job structure. But the fact is that what the mission was that it was assumed that companies would always. Uh, 
you know, keep their workers employed, either through union uh, uh, seniority rules or through uh, the norms of, of, uh, of the career with one company. That fell apart in the 1980s. Now, at that point, African Americans got hit for worse and first, and, and I really believe having done the study, that if it's still been United States a largely an all white working class, uh, the Reagan era wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't have been all this getting rid of free, uh, uh, you know, uh, university education in, in public universities, which was available. Uh, all kinds of things that were going to the white working class would have been sustained. Uh, so, so you have, and then you have immigration policy, both uh, which is bringing very highly educated workers, mainly from Asia, and low educated, lowly low educated workers from Latin America and the United States, and everybody's forgetting about upgrading the labor force. Uh, both, and so this is where the investment triad comes in, because the investment triad has to say, let's keep people productive, uh, and let's have the, this potential for upward social mobility. Okay, a country like the United States should not have the number of low paid exploited people it has. Amazon should not be able to employ in the United States a uh, million plus people at, at low wage jobs, which are better than most other companies, but are still you know, $30,000 a year and, and, and without any uh, security. And, and of course they're trying to form unions, but they should not be able to do that in, in a prosperous economy like the United States, except that not only was upward mobility undermined by the rise of shareholder value, but downward mobility was increased. And so you have more and more people who have no other option but to take these kinds of jobs and crowd into these kinds of jobs. So yeah, so that has to be dealt with, but the way I would deal with it is not just say, okay, uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to, but I wouldn't see as, as sufficient a guaranteed wage. I wouldn't be opposed. To, I'm certainly uh, supportive of unions, but I think what you need to do is get a share of the productivity. So if you can change the way in which the value is shared out, uh, you uh, will get a more equitable distribution of income and you will get what you're calling many of the poor being joining the middle class, as has happened before. Uh, now, this is middle class in terms of standard of living. And, you know, maybe it's it's not middle class in terms of uh, a job that uh, uh, is a knowledge working job, et cetera. But it's, it's, it's uh, I'm talking about a standard of living that could exist that does not exist in a society that could afford it. Um, actually, one of the things that I've been thinking of, right, I'll just end with this, uh, and answer this question. Uh, I mean, Amazon is a very interesting company, obviously, uh, but because it's actually spends more than any company in history on R and D, on the one side, and virtually no uh, African American Hispanics, very few are employed at those high wage level uh, way, uh, level jobs, professional jobs it has. Um, but at the uh, level of uh, the, the distribution centers, deliveries, uh, about uh, over 30% of their million plus employees in the United States are probably about, probably now about a million just at that level are called uh, helpers. Uh, they, uh, 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 about 34% are, are African-American, about 25% Hispanic, and that's where they're drawing this labor force from. Uh, they're now starting to form unions. Uh, Jeff Bezos, who's one of the richest people in the world, of course, actually uh, um, would uh, is now under pressure in Amazon for the first time, which has never paid a dividend. So it's a, it was a retained and reinvest company. Uh, but Amazon is now started doing stock buybacks because it's being attacked by hedge fund activists with this very small amount of shares like Apple has been. Now, Bezos, the smartest thing he could do, because he doesn't have dual class shares and he could actually be thrown out of, of Amazon, would be to give every worker a $3 an hour wage rate to recognize the union and to tie up all the profits from year to year of Amazon in benefits for the workers. Because the alternative is gonna be, he's gonna become like Apple. And all those profits are going to go to people who make absolutely no contribution to the company. 
So he should become, you know, a fervent, uh, uh, crit uh, uh, um, you know, or adopt a critique. I mean, just listen to my lecture and, and, and just say, get rid of buybacks. We don't need that because it, it, it does him no good. Uh, uh, and, but he's not going to do that, obviously. He's because that would be such an ideological shift. That would be such a, but that's what he should do. And, and in fact, Amazon would be less of a pariah company from that point of view. It would be a, uh, uh, a company where you could actually get some upper mobility. Uh, we've already the same thing about Apple, the work, people who work in Apple stores. Um, we, we figured out that at current, current employment levels over the last decade, uh, every worker at Apple now, which is about 100,000, um, uh, could be... Uh, uh, on average, have had three and a half million dollars more if they hadn't done buybacks. Uh, so I was in an Apple store. I asked someone how long he had worked there. He said a decade. And I said, uh, well, I told him he could have had three and a half million dollars more if they hadn't done buybacks. I'm not sure he knew what I was talking about. But in any case, you know, you get the point. Uh, there, there, there needs to be a, uh, a change in the, the, not just the distribution of income, but in, in the distribution of income in the investment of productive capabilities so you have much fewer working poor. That, that does not solve the problems of the global south, but the global south needs to adopt these kind of principles of innovative enterprise. And actually China has done that and a lot of Asian countries have done that and a lot of companies that do well in, in, in the global south have this kind of retain and reinvest uh, 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 approach. So. Uh, it, it, it is the way, of, it's not going to save the poor all over the place, but it is the way of getting the poor out of, out of poverty and, uh, and uh, having upward mobility. And again, whatever one thinks about the, the political regime in China, that is something where they've had huge success through investment and innovation. Thanks for your answer. And I'll pass the, the speech to my team. Okay, thanks, Professor, for your answer. Uh, now we would like to talk uh, a bit about sustainable prosperity and growth. Uh, first of all, uh, we understand sustainable uh, prosperity as a normative statement uh, that will be thought not only as an economic category, but also as a social one given in the notes uh, socially desirable characteristics of the of the economy when referring to a larger middle class and when raising equity concerns. Um, already the, the early work of, of Dali, Joseph Roshan uh, and others uh, highlighted the limited character of natural resources and um, growing levels of entropy uh, in the production system and that this will impose limits to growth. Also, in the IPCC uh, pointed out in several reports recently that the business as usual scenario could have um, irreversible impacts on the environment and therefore ecological aspects uh, are or should be one of the main concerns of today's society. And uh, nonetheless, all these concerns um, in, in, in your analysis, ecological aspects seem to be uh, much less important than productivity and growth, and uh, they are not really integrated in, in the analysis. Um, and furthermore, like the, the growth imperative has been repeatedly challenged in the light of the ecological crisis, and some authors um, have even used uh, simulation models to test this imperative. For example, Victor and Rosenbluth um, proposed that economic growth in developed countries is neither uh, necessary or not sufficient to meet a uh, policy objectives like uh, reducing uh, unemployment or uh, uh, reducing poverty also. So uh, finally, we think that uh, it is not only important to, be, to discuss about growth, but even when uh, accepting growth, uh, it is important to discuss how the possible growth trajectories a country will follow taking into account um, social constructions of the desirable past. So we wanted to, to ask you um, 
if you think that we could talk about uh, sustainable prosperity as an economic and social category without addressing and integrating ecological aspects in the analysis? And maybe what growth trajectory you think uh, would be desirable in this regard? Thanks. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, first of all, that all the discussion uh, about economic growth, uh, you probably rarely hear the term innovation used. Uh, so, it's growth, more growth, less growth. Okay, uh, growth is an outcome, but, but the, con the, the substance of it, which makes it make, make it worthwhile and lead to sustainable prosperity, is, has to do with. Uh, the, the quality of that growth. And so innovation, a high quality, low cost product. Okay. So first of all, and as I said, when in my presentation, you know, what's a high quality product? Uh, there was a time when if uh, just about oh, 30 years ago, if I got on an airplane, I had to inhale somebody's smoke, right? Because people did not see that as uh, the, you know the people who were smoking for them there was a high quality product they even had to smoke in a plane and, and give me cancer or give me, you know whatever. Uh, but science then determined uh, and and political movements determined that this was not high quality and although uh, you could still smoke you have to pay high taxes and you couldn't smoke in public places. It's not true everywhere, but certainly. Uh, um, I, I haven't taken a flight and it changed in the early 90s and I haven't taken a flight where I had to, to, to I remember having an argument in the early 90s on SAS because the only the back four rows can, could smoke and I was in the, the fifth row to the back and I said, well, it's like I'm spinning, sitting in a smoking session as they said, too bad. That that disappeared actually within a, a year or two. So, so social movements determine what is high quality. Uh, and of course, this has all kinds of things to do. I mean, smoking it's a, it does ecological damage, damage to our bodies, uh, fossil fuels, uh, you know, uh, toxins, et cetera. Uh, we overcome these things through uh, recognizing that uh, if we have a product that seems to be serving its purpose, but it's killing us or it's poisoning us in the process, uh, and there's lots and lots of products, let's say, uh, uh, chemicals used in, in companies that they say, hey, this is really good for manufacturing the process, but it turns out that it's a toxin. Uh, then you have to say, well, no, the product that's turned out by this, uh, we're not going to call high quality. You know, you have ISO standards around the world, actually, for some time have been doing this, of setting green standards. But, you know, so, so then you say, okay, how do you solve this problem? Do you just say you can't produce the product? No, you have innovation. And you have to find ways of learning how to deal with the, uh, uh, you know, the thing that's degrading the environment in whichever way. And, and that becomes part of it. And in fact, politically, it does become part of how people talk about the quality of a product. Uh, um, uh, you know, I can go back to Ralph Nader, uh, who you've probably all heard of, you know, unsafe at any speed, started the whole consumer movement in the United States. He said that these small cars that you, people are driving are, are very low quality because they're uh, you, you'll die in them. They're unsafe. Um, and uh, uh, actually, uh, it's not in this paper, but uh, I'll tell you just the, the one way of talking about this because uh, Nader had a big impact on uh, on uh, actually corporate America and actually on the move to shareholder value because they didn't want to deal with the issues that he was raising in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, most of you probably have heard of the article by Milton Friedman. I've, I've written this up somewhere and I can refer you to if you want more detail. Uh, the social responsibility of a company is to increase its profits compared to the New York Times in 1970. And the context, however, is not that well known because it's seen as an article, Milton Friedman, of course, Chicago economist, that, that was the precursor of Jensen and actually inspired Jensen to do all this stuff about shareholder value. And uh, it appeared again in September of 1970 in the, Wall in the New York Times. But the context, which if you go actually look at the original is clear that General Motors, the car company, uh, had had a uh, annual meeting of shareholders in 19, uh, May of uh, 1970 
in which, inspired by Nader's movement, there was something called Campaign GM, which wanted to put three people on the board of directors uh, who were public representatives who were arguing for safer cars and more fuel efficient cars or more ecological cars, right? And uh, that was overwhelmingly voted down by the proxy votes of shareholders. Uh, but General Motors, the, the chair actually was somewhat sympathetic uh, to this, or at least not totally opposed to it, and appointed a subcommittee of existing board members to look into the problem. Uh, Friedman was then uh, recruited to write this article for the New York Times, and it explicitly says, you know, in the, 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 the magazine article and the stuff around it, that uh, uh, Friedman saw this kind of creating a some group of the board to look into safe and more fuel efficient cars as pure, pure and unadulterated socials. Okay, uh, and he and you know just you know uh, you know any 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 executive who, who fell prey to this was just becoming a, an intellectual softy and just falling prey to you know, to the, to the ecologists or whatever. Well, in fact, uh, we know the history of what happened to the car industry subsequently. The companies that were in the forefront of producing safer and more fuel efficient cars won out against General Motors in market shares. So General Motors should have adopted, uh, uh, should have had those people on the board. We should have welcomed those people on the board, um, but they didn't. And in fact, it went in just the opposite direction. Now, underlying that is, I, I would argue, is two very different theories. Uh, I, I said what 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 he was telling them is do. In fact, from the point of view of theory of innovative enterprises, don't be innovative. Uh, just uh, you know, produce the same rotten cars that people are willing to buy, and and then in fact. Over time, they're not going to buy them. So he said, saying, you know, uh, and it's pure and un unadulterated socialism. He was suggesting you produce cars in any different way. Whereas, you know, the answer to your question, the theory of innovative enterprise uh, and the definition of sustainable prosperity said, no, they should have made different choices uh, about those cars. And that was not a, a counter to General Motors being able to employ people, being profitable, being able to be sustain itself as a company over time. In fact, that is the path to, to leadership in the industry. And we see some of the same things going on with the, uh, with the we've been studying the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the EV revolution. And, uh, and one problem with the EV revolution is that, at least in the United States in particular, it's become so financialized that even where it's a success, uh, the financial dimensions of it uh, are overwhelming. Uh, so it's a co company like Tesla. Uh, and the leaders are the Chinese. Uh, and uh, they are retaining and re reinvesting. And they have become financialized. Uh, mm -hmm. In the United States, virtually any startup now, it, it's kind of ended now that the market is down. That uh, because of the success of Tesla on the stock market, uh, uh, that called itself a battery company, EV company, was getting tons of money thrown at it, and a lot of it just went nowhere, and it was not backed by any consistent government policy. So, so I would say yes. I mean, we the studies need to be done on this, but it totally fits within the framework that I laid out. I would argue. Okay, I think there is one last question from the yeah. discussant. So it has been a little bit long for this part, but anyway, so Malena will ask her final question. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you if you can uh, be a, not one not to take too much time because okay. then we have the questions of all the other students. <laughs> okay, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Malena. Yeah, thank you. So to be brief, um, we just what we were wondering because your your paper has a lot of uh, policy implications. Uh, but we were wondering about what's the role, I mean, we recognize or, or corporate governance literature recognize how institutions play a crucial role in defining and draping capitalist relations. Uh, there are also interactions between stakeholders that we can recognize in the innovation triad. And we know that when these interactions are happening, different interests, uh, power structures and aim are at stake. 
Um, and so having this in mind and knowing that there can be state captures, as you also recognize in the paper with some of the policy measures taken undertaken by the SEC, and that you can have revolving doors and lobby by companies, uh, how feasible are all these policies in reality? That is, uh, we know what we need to do to get into the sustainable path, um, but how uh, possible is to do that in uh, reality, to say so? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different institutional mentions, but and I'll just, uh, from my point of view, uh, and this uh, is much more so the case in the United States uh, than than in Europe, but it's um, it's the phenomenon of companies buying back their own stock uh, is so large and so uh, among major companies that could be doing different things with the money, including raising the workers' wages, including their productivity, coming up with new innovations, that uh, that if you buy into their right to do that and, and don't see that as a problem. Even if you're the most progressive person in the world, and we could write, I could write, if I had time, I uh, maybe, you know, I have done a little bit about this, but write an article uh, about people who just don't get it, in my view, uh, that first of all, people who buy shares on the market, whether it's Warren Buffett or somebody, you know, who just has some uh, extra cash around or their, their, their savings, they're not investors in the company. They're just savers who are, you know, just buying and selling shares. And you privilege them, and you say whatever they want, they have to get. Then you got a big problem. And actually, so this is not just or even conservatives who are saying this is some of the most progressive uh, think tanks in the United States. Just ignore this issue entirely. And they ignore it largely because they do not understand the firm. They do not understand the process of innovation, the role it plays in the economy. So that's why I would put it, that at the center. And because I think the, the resource allocation decision is of critical importance, uh, this is the, the real weak link. This is the, the you know, between, you know, and, and it, it manifests itself just with, for example, this is not going to change the world, and Intel may never catch up with uh, uh, Taiwan and Korea. But they put a production guy there in charge, who he was the head of their uh, chip uh, design in the, the uh, '80s, and they said, "Okay, try to get us back on track." If every company said, "Let's stop doing buybacks and let's invest in the labor force and let's really try to be innovative," you start having a very different company. So, since it's very difficult for any one of them to say it. Just ban the damn things, and, and in the process of having the argument of why why you need to ban them, you at least come to a consensus or at least a different view about what is wrong with the way in which resources are allocated in the economy. So I, I, I start right there at the heart of financialization, which is these trillions of dollars of buybacks that are done by major companies you know, over the over the decades. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so maybe we can switch uh, our cameras for all and, and start the discussion with, with everybody. Uh, if you have a questions, you can put a star in the chat so that we have the order of the discussions. Uh, Mohamed, first. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor. I greatly enjoyed the, the presentation. My name is Mohamed Rabib. I am from Mauritania and my interest focus on global monetary policy and international monetary flows. So I'm really interested in this topic and I can ask a million questions. So I will try to be brief. I have three, two or three questions. My first question is that we can see that an important share of the rise of stock buybacks and increase in firm financialization occurred after the crisis of 2008, which many economists impute to the role of the Fed and quantitative easing. So although the Fed is still doing QE now, and honestly, it cannot really stop, it's raising interest rate, which will be, I think, a bond to the bond market, which I believe may drive money out of the stock market. So, and QE also is less significant now compared with 2009. Can we expect a reversal of this uh, corporate policy of stock buybacks once the Fed stops QE, or at least lowers Q QE significantly. 
Um, okay, so that's a very interesting question. So first of all, no buybacks did not start after the financial crisis. They they uh, quadrupled for S and P five hundred companies between two thousand and three two thousand and seven. They started becoming much more systemic before the financial crisis, and in fact contributed to the crisis. Um, although the crisis occurred, of course, much more in the subprime market, but it was really to chase for wherever you could find them for higher yields. That was the problem. Uh, okay, the second thing in terms of, it really had to do with Fed policy. Of course, you get all this nonsense about, you know, you need a higher rate of inflation, to, you know, uh, or a high rate of unemployment to bring down inflation. It, it has nothing to do with it. Uh, okay, what the Fed does not have that much control over the economy because, uh, uh, you know, companies, for example, if they use their retained earnings to reinvest, they often don't take on any debt, uh, and and they can just grow. And and uh, uh, now I think the, the quantitative easing uh, came from the, the need to get a kind of a financial recovery, and uh, that got all kinds of the stock market going, the trading going, but. Now, whether it was understood the extent to which companies would use the low interest rates to buy back their stock is another question. Uh, but that was one of the things they did with it. So it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, taking, oh, we can get money for almost nothing and invest in a very uncertain innovative products. And now that doesn't mean that a company that had uh, you know, top executives that wanted to do that, that you know, cheap money wasn't wasn't couldn't be useful, but that was not the way it was often used. Now, I think my own view is, I mean, I'm not an expert in this area, but is that uh, the Fed having, what they realized is that having bailed out uh, the, the housing market and the financial crisis, and then in the early stage of the pandemic, they started buying up uh, junk bonds, corporate bonds to keep the bond market from, 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 from collapsing. They knew that the next thing that they'd have to come in basically as a you know, lender of last resort, but in this case, a buyer of last resort was the stock market. And I think they understood that the stock market had become so speculative. And so uh, I would argue also because of their own QE policies manipulated in different part, that, that, that if it crashed, they would not be able to, uh, you know, to buy up all these stocks and, 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 and restore the stock market. So I think that the higher interest rates are trying to get money out of the stock market, create, and they've had, I think, that effect. Uh, uh, but there's so much money out there that that doesn't mean that the money is staying, you know, there's no money in the stock market is drying up. There is too much money looking for too few for opportunities, you know, for higher yields and not, you know, in the global economy and particularly in the rich countries or, or you know. And so I think that that's what the Fed is about. It is trying to prevent the next crash that it's going to have to bail out. And the stock market crash is something that would be, uh, uh, it, it, would, it would just be over, uh, overwhelmed uh, to, to bail it out. And so I think it's trying to, it's kind of like, you know, uh, let's just, Keep raising rates, get people to put money in fixed interest, uh, and uh, make the stock market less speculative, or at least you know reduce the boom. You know, uh, and to some extent that's working. On the other hand, it's not reducing buybacks one bit. Uh, it uh, it uh, they were at record levels in 2021, and probably be even greater in 2022 among and. And I should say that buybacks are being done among the biggest companies. And so it's, uh, and, and there's a whole other dimension of this value extraction, which, which we've started studying, which, 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 uh, which is private equity and uh, which operates much more in services and in non-tech uh, sectors, which is extracting money from the economy. So it's not the only part of the corporate economy uh, where you're getting predatory value extraction. But I think that's, the Fed's role is is very limited, you know. And then economists couch it as if it's, this has to do with the whole future of you know employment and you know stability in the economy as a whole, which is I think nonsense. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, so, Professor. I okay. still have another question. Yes, let's put another star because otherwise <laughs> I will be okay. Put another star because there are other few questions and I would not like to just monopolize the time. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Professor, thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like to know your opinion on the idea that legitimizes paybacks on the basis that firms that had an excess of cash that is not needed uh, for investment, either because uh, new technology is reducing the need for fixed as assets or because of a lack of investment opportunities within the firm. Uh, but on the contrary, that these funds that leave the large corporations in the form of paybacks could be reallocated or reinvested in smaller and more um, agile companies that are better suited to compete in the economy. Then um, uh, in this way, paybacks should be, might be acting as as agents of progress in a humanitarian way of creative destruction. And I also would like to know if the answer might be given by the irony that you mentioned in the presentation, the irony of uh, maximizing, maximizing uh, shareholder value. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, yeah, the whether the, the money is needed or not, it depends on the company. I, I think if I take the case of Apple again, uh, despite this over half a trillion dollars in, in less than 10 years of buybacks, they still have plenty of money rolling in. They might not have that forever, but they have it now. Uh, one point I should make is that uh, some critics say that, well, you know, that's better off being used elsewhere. If, if Apple just put those, that money into bonds, into various types of corporate securities, it would circulate through the economy. So they don't have to do buybacks in order for that money to be used you know, in the economy. I mean, it would just be their you know, investment decision how to do it. Now, the other side of which I have made this argument is that a company, first of all, that if you're gonna do startup companies, it's not just a matter of money. Uh, there's always in the United States since the late 1970s been more money available for venture capital and there's been good companies. And then we, we get off, off and in, in booms, get it into companies that aren't so good. Uh, so you have to find the people and the ideas and, 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 and put together the organizations uh, that can actually develop the, 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 these products and, and, and sustain them with the finance. Now, certainly, uh, I'd say a company like Apple could do that. Uh, so one of the things I point out in almost everything I write about them is they have a very small board of directors. And maybe you could say, well, they don't know very much about you know, ecological products or you know, clean technology. And therefore, you know, how is Apple going to take some of that 100 million or 200 million or a billion or 2 billion or 20 billion, which is still a small fraction of what they're spending a year and, and put it into some you know, new companies that are going to uh, you know, have revolutionary green technology products. Well, you, you could argue that until I point out that the long, second longest serving board member of Apple is Al, Al Gore who's been there since 2003, three years before he put out an inconvenient truth. And that, I won't say what I even think of him, uh, uh, is sitting there allowing that company, there's only about seven people on the board, to just spew out that money to people that don't matter and going around talking about the problems of climate change when he could be having with that company a direct impact. And, and the, I think in line with your question, this would not be, you know, anti-innovation or anti, you know, they might, they don't need to do it as part of Apple, but as a company backed by Apple and maybe with some people coming out of Apple, you know, uh, to pursue their careers with startups or people being attracted to, to it because it's backed by Apple, they could have built all kinds of companies. One of the things we point out in one of our papers is that Apple, the rise of uh, TSMC and, and Samsung as the major uh, foundries in the world for advanced chips is because of Apple first Samsung, then particularly TSMC in Taiwan. Apple could have built at a fraction of what it spewed out in buybacks, its own, its own fab. 
uh, you know, so even, even within its own industry and even for its own needs, it could have made investments. Yeah, so I, told, uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know, corporate venturing and using the capabilities within companies and setting up new companies and giving people who have been trained in, you know, in, in your company a chance to set up their own company uh, in some, particularly in some, you know, field that's emerging like the ecological field. Yeah, that's, 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 that could be going on all the time and it's not. So uh, yeah, it's not that the companies, when they're really profitable, should be putting all that money back into their one company and growing, growing. It's possible to do that when they're that profitable, but they can certainly be doing what you're suggesting. Thanks. Uh, maybe I will take a couple of questions so that we answer groups of questions. So Leonard and then Manahir. Um, yes, thanks professor for the presentation and also for this interesting paper. And I was wondering about um, a certain more specific point. Uh, you mentioned um, that Pfizer stopped the, the stock buybacks as an idea of re-innovating their own drug pipeline and own uh, innovation uh, in their own company. But in, in like this year, the company already like underwent like again, uh, stock buybacks and reached 2 billion uh, US dollars in buybacks. And they have up to 3.3 billion uh, still in the pipeline that they can use for share purchases. Um, so the, the question is, on the other hand, they only spent in this year for uh, 5.1 billion yet on R&D innovation. So it, it seems that even when a big pharmaceutical company commits to the non-share buyback program, it's not really, it doesn't hold that long, especially when so much cash after the vaccine drives in. And what is then possible to see, which is kind of interesting that uh, like three years uh, later after saying one would focus on research innovation in their own company, um, that the share buybacks are way higher than their own drug innovation uh, or that the money that they spend in their own drug innovation. So my question would be, is that just due to the fact that so much cash was laying around in the company, so they had to do something with it kind of, or is it more that even if a company would like to focus on their own drug innovation, that this is impossible for a company uh, as Pfizer or also as Apple. Like if Apple would un, like uh, stop repur uh, repurchasing the shares, is it even possible for a company to do that? Or is that just a shallow argument? Yeah. Um, because in the end, we, we don't see that they really uh, can commit to this. Yeah, thank you. We take also the question of Manahil, so. Thank you so much, Professor. I really like the presentation. Um, I'm from Pakistan, and in Pakistan, only a few companies choose this uh, stock buyback programs, but there has been a lot of recent debate in the financial sector that corporations need to initiate uh, this form of payout, especially since 2019. And one of the major arguments is that since 2017 until 2022, the corporate profits uh, have doubled, yet the investors have not benefited from the share price appreciation and the capital gain. And some of the biggest companies, CEOs have made their case in favor of it by saying that they have a PE ratio of two, which is ridiculously low. And so for them, the best investment, I mean, according to them, is that they buy back their shares and that if they don't, the corporate sector will suffer and this will result in a already like in a further economic slowdown. Um, however, this is also an economy with a huge weight, wealth inequality already. So I guess my question is, are stock buybacks only bad for like an established economy like the US or it can be taken as a general rule even for economies like Pakistan that have an unstable stock market, there's a lack of public interest, economic, political uncertainty and like an ailing market share. Um, and because you also mentioned that some Asian economies are uh, choosing alternative methods. Um, so is there an alternative method that could be used to, um, you know, to increase the market share? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay, so, so I answer the first one first, or uh, yeah, as you want. <laughs> you answer both. Oh, let me answer the second one first. It's, uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, first of all, I think you have to look at the particular situations uh, in, in the South. Uh, it's not always the case, uh, even in the United States, when a company does stock buybacks that they're manipulating the market. <laughs> Uh, in fact, Amazon, uh, before, more, more recently, it, it started to do some, uh, between 2006 and 2012, did a lot of stock buybacks to put shares in a fund 
or they give one or two shares to each of their workers in the, the, the uh, warehouses and delivery workers, full-time workers. Uh, they And as they were giving out these shares, they bought some shares and presumably tried to get them cheaply on the market to put into this fund. In fact, the companies in the United States even before in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s uh, 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 did that. Uh, so you'd see it's buybacks, but it's not really trying to manipulate the market. There was a limit to doing that because once their employment grew and the stock price went up, it became too expensive. They still start, they were still giving up the shares until about 2018, but they, uh, 2012, they stopped trying to offset dilution. Uh, there's other cases where buybacks are being done because people want to get control of the company uh, and uh, and move it in, a, in an innovative direction. And those are often done through in, through tender offers. Um, so an important case of that is Michael Dell taking his company private. It, it would show up as a huge stock buyback of uh, I think $30 billion or something like that. Uh, but that was to get out of the, out of the, you know, uh, the line of fire of people like Carl Icahn trying to extract value from the company in order to invest in in, in, in uh, more advanced technology, which they were successful doing at Dell. Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to say about any, you know, what's going on in any particular country or whether this is just people playing the market and trying to do the buybacks when no one else knows they're doing them and then selling the shares and and, and trying to make out. Uh, the, uh, you know, but the, um, that, is, that can off, also be the case. So without doing the empirical research, you know, about what is actually going on, uh, you don't necessarily know that the phenomenon that, uh, that I'm criticizing is the phenomenon, you know, is, is, is actually what's occurring. Uh, in the case of Pfizer, uh, I think, it, 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 you know, this is again, why you need to study at, at a company level and, you know, it's, we have a framework for doing that, and 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 but it takes a lot of resources, and uh, and that is that uh, whether without the pandemic coming along, Pfizer's attempt to, after three decades of financialization, to try to actually develop internal uh, products would have been successful. It's hard to say because then the pandemic came along and they uh, made it, had this bonanza. Now, the, the one thing from our research, and we do a lot of research on this, is that the uh, very fact that they had a relationship with BioNTech, the German company that actually developed the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, uh, had to do from this change in strategy. Although it was more in the organization, the research organization, try to find some smaller companies to partner with to uh, have you know, acquire them, maybe have internal development that way, uh, um, you know, acquire them at a young stage uh, or have some collaboration with them. Uh, in fact, uh, when the pandemic, uh, well, uh, when at the point where BioNTech decided that it was going to put, it was, you know, it was trying to produce cancer drugs with mRNA and decided it was going to try to produce a vaccine, which it moved on a, a very quickly to do because of the nature of the company and, and uh, the way it was run uh, in February, of, uh, January, February of 2020. At first, Pfizer said, no, they didn't want to uh, collaborate with them in, in manufacturing and distributing the vaccine. But then a month later, when the, it was declared a pandemic, they said yes. Now, the, the fact is that Pfizer's, and I think this is generally true of big, big pharma, uh, they're in, in the world of bio, biotech, uh, particularly, uh, and with the decline of corporate research labs because of people going to smaller companies where, uh, uh, from, 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 from big corporate research labs at, at pharma, which have declined now for over 30 years, uh, they're not very good at, at internal innovation. Uh, doesn't mean they can't do it, but they're not very good at it. What they are good at and why they are big pharma is because they're really good at manufacturing and marketing, uh, particularly man mass manufacturing. And so it doesn't matter how financialized they are, uh, if they get pat you know, control over a patented drug and they have a huge market out there, they better be able to produce it so it's not contaminated, so it's safe, so it's mass produce it. And, uh, uh, you know, as efficiently as possible. And that's what big pharma companies actually have long been 
good at doing. And so the, the, the research and the innovation has now turned much more to the small companies, often in, in collaboration with the government. Uh, in the case of the other mRNA vaccine, Moderna, they did practically nothing to develop that vaccine. It was all the National Institutes of Health and they made all the money out of it. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's, you know, so there's a, a different roles that are being play, play, played here. Um, yeah, so uh, it's hard to say, but, uh, you know, and, and I think also the last thing I'll say is that, that in all these companies, there is a struggle between financialization and innovation. So I think and all of a sudden, uh, Pfizer said, let's do a couple billion dollars of buybacks. There were some people pushing for this, and then some people pushed back and say, hey, no, you know, our profit stream might drop off with uh, uh, if, if the pandemic is, uh, you know, uh, disappears, the vaccines are no longer needed. So they, you know, who knows? And and that we don't know what 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 the thinking is going on. With all this trillions of dollars and buybacks. This is one of the best kept secrets I, I, of, of how they even make these decisions about how much to buy. And I've never, I've studied this as much as anybody. I've not seen a, uh, really anything about saying, why did Apple do 85 billion rather than 40 billion? Uh, or, or why did, you know, it, it just, it just goes on as if it's, you know, with, with, without any accountability, without even any, any reason given for doing these massive amounts of buying. Thank you. Okay. We, yeah, we have two questions, Otto and then Joaquin and Mathieu. Thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation and uh, for this discussion. I, was, I wanted to ask you about um, income inequality and wealth inequality in the US, uh, because you mentioned that you would like uh, wage increases and uh, welfare increases to be tied to productivity gains. Um, and I think Malena, Juanma, and Quantan were trying to underline that uh, um, maybe when, when we talk about the middle class and such, uh, we might be um, like not concentrating on the working class. And I was wondering if uh, this idea of tying uh, wage increases to productivity gains might have a similar issue in the sense that you have industries where you have stagnating uh, productivity um, and then you have industries where it increases. Um, kind of fast. So if you have that kind of a policy, would that then also kind of cause uh, wage differences between industries and then have some workers who have less um, or like stagnating real wages still? Yeah. And um, like considering this fact, um, like to me, it seems that the productivity gain argument is kind of a long-term argument. And, and to me, it seems that you need in the short run, you need some like kind of kinds of radical uh, policies in the U.S. to reallocate wealth and uh, incomes. So I was wondering what would you do in this, this yeah. to solve this yeah. problem? Thank you. Yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, now we take a second question. Okay. If you don't mind. okay. So yeah, thank you, Professor. Oh, I wanted to ask a question first, which might sound stupid, but anyway, uh, um, it's, uh, the, the the strategy to buy back for buy buy back shares is limited because just the amount of shares are limited and the question is to which extent firms can do, do this kind of strategy and under which amount of shares they can just continue to do, do that and the other question is like i assume there's different solution to for buyback shares and um, uh, uh, retain earnings can be a solution and do they also borrow money is, is it possible to buy back by borrowing money and what could be the consequences the the signal on on financial market if they do one strategy on on another one for for buyback shares thank you yeah well I, I i did mention this that they they compete to get their stock price up and so companies particularly when interest rates were low, we're doing lots of borrowing to buy back shares, including a company like Apple, which uh, because until uh, changes in the tax law occurred at the end of 2017, uh, they didn't want to bring their profits abroad uh, to the United States because it would get taxed at 35% uh, tax rate. So they actually borrowed money uh, to do buybacks in the United States, a company, you know, $60 billion, a company that had uh, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in cash, but not all of it uh, uh, available in the United States. And that actually changed with the, the, the rules that allowed them to bring back the money, lower the, the corporate tax rate and bring back that money at a very low tax rate. And uh, that's why in 2018, it was a record year 
uh, for buybacks, uh, which was surpassed in 2021. But uh, I think it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, uh, there's, it's really a competition among companies to, to get their stock price up and, and which is accepted uh, and by, even by progressive economists and politicians. Uh, you know, I've heard Elizabeth Warren, who you've probably heard of, Senator from Massachusetts, you know, is very progressive, but she said, oh, the stock market's up. Well, that's good, but they said, well, maybe it's not good, <laughs> you know, or, or, or you know. Now, uh, uh, the thing uh, about the, the uh, wages and productivity. Uh, yeah, I think that, first of all, where uh, it's harder to capture the productivity uh, because there's excess, you know, there's it's easy to replace workers, even though uh, replacing workers has its costs. I mean, that's where unions have generally played the biggest role in companies. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, providing all kinds of employment security and benefits. But, uh, you know, so you need to have it at the lower, you know, end, uh, end of the, uh, um, uh, well, for, for low paid workers or even workers who, who are not so low paid, you need to have some union power to in, enforce these things. I think when you have that, and there's a long, you know, kind of literature on this, uh, this often forces the companies that can be more productive to, to uh, be productive or to stay in business uh, in order to pay those wages. And so it kind of force is a kind of forcing mechanism of companies of uh, innovation. Now, of course, they could try to do it by just speeding up the work, making workers work longer, harder, you know, classic exploitation uh, modes, but but also they could do it through innovation, particularly if the unions, uh, you know, you know, uh, bargaining over these kinds of issues of that, that limit the extent to which workers be, be exploited, you know, in order to get higher wages. And these debates are going on all the time. Uh, I think that, you know, and I said that stuff about Amazon, if it raised everybody's wages, not only would that raise wages on Amazon, that would raise wages throughout the economy, because everybody now would have to compete with, a, in this case, with just one huge employer uh, for, for low, low wage uh, uh, labor. Uh, so, so that uh, the so if major companies really which generally actually do pay more even for low wage labor, paid even more and, and saw the distribution of their profits uh, as being uh, earmarked for uh, uh, higher wages for their workers, more employment stability. This would have an effect throughout, throughout the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that, that's the way they used to see it, not, you know, in the, you know up until the 1980s. Um, uh, if you look at old annual reports, you see companies bragging about how much of their, uh, 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 over the last decade of their revenues and, and profits went to uh, uh, more, more employment, higher wages, and how much went to shareholders. And no, no company would, you know, they don't even publish the data on how much their workers are getting paid now. Okay, we have then three, uh, the three final questions from Lucas, uh, Mohamed again, and uh, Manahil, and okay, four questions together. <laughs> Lucas. Lucas said his question was already answered, so he can be skipped. Okay, great. So, uh, Mohamed. Okay, uh, I, I'm here again, Professor. So, I just have a question about the institutional aspect of our debate because. We, we are observing that there, there is increasing political pol pol polarization in the US, which has led to a <coughs> para paralysis. So for instance, we see that the SEC and also the EPA and other organ or government agencies have been trying to fill in that gap to, to, to create their own rules, but, but also they have been planting the ire of Republicans who are suing them every day. Uh, for instance, back in February, a federal court in Texas ruled against the SEC after it indicted a hedge fund manager citing the doctrine of non-delegation. 
And when we take the doctrine of non-delegation, which is, is being embraced by Republicans, when we take this doctrine to the extreme, we will basically um, nullify or close all government agencies because non-delegation in, in the US Constitution says that the, uh, in the US Congress cannot delegate any authority to other agencies. So my, my question here is that I think um, government agencies are aware of the Supreme Court being conservative and of the court being very skeptical of their uh, authority. So how can we really propose solutions to all these problems, particularly like legis uh, particularly regulatory solutions without really attracting the attacks of Republicans in court? Okay. Uh I, I will add other simple questions as, as that of Mohamed Malahil. <laughs> um, professor, I'm just, I'm really sorry. I think uh, I missed your answer for my question because you were answering question one first. But however, if your answer was that uh, they're not always bad and there's lack of empirical evidence, then my question, uh, another question I have is that for, for a lot of years, US pharmaceutical companies have also um, fought um, price regulation by arguing that the high price that Americans pay for medicines compared to other nations provide more profits to the company and that leads to more drug innovation. Um, so is that also true? Because you mentioned that they're not always bad. So how, how can we figure out if they are bad or not? Thank you. Okay, and again, Joaquin or Mathieu? Yes, all right. Uh, well, thank you. I think you have to. No, no. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation. I want to do like a follow up on Matthew's question about the limit to the buybacks, because there is a limited amount of shares that you can buy back. And um, how do, yeah, how, how is that actually? I don't know. So, how um, analyze and couldn't we think of it as a case of a finite game? In which we know the end because there is a limit and yeah how do you handle it like, um, uh, yeah um okay uh, let me well, let me ask the the one about the the drug companies we've written a lot quite a lot on this uh and their buybacks so we know so we studied them and in fact uh you know people who argue you know that the the drug the 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 drug companies and their lobbies in the United States particularly say that they need a high drug prices because they get innovation from the profits. So that in a way, they're saying that they're recognizing that, you know, a theory of innovative enterprise that, you know, that they're retaining, but then we say, well, but they're not doing that. So we, we, we actually in our research are the ones that have pointed that out to people. And so we have quite a bit, I can <laughs> send you the papers. Um, and we did it originally <laughs> to, uh, a UN um, panel on access to medicines in 2016. We wrote and we wrote some papers that and documented uh, the buybacks we're doing, and we know how they're what, what they're doing with those buybacks. So they're not good. They're they're just to prop up their stock prices, and 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 so that it really undercuts that argument. Uh, you know, um, so we pay higher in the United States, pay higher prices for pharmaceutical drugs. So that the companies not just can have higher profits, but so that they can use those profits to pump up their stock price, enrich the uh, CEOs, the uh, hedge fund activists, etc. And uh, and uh, uh, we so we pay we pay higher drug prices in order for them to have higher stock prices and higher uh, gain, re realize gains from their stock. And so why why would you want to uh, allow them to do this? Uh, and uh, for something that's a matter of life and death, you know, the, the drugs, and also supported by the government. Yeah, so we've made that argument, and it's, uh, there's a number of papers that we have where it's uh, laid out. Again, you can look at the Institute for New Economic Thinking website. Um, on the uh, uh, the uh, the question of, uh, I wasn't quite sure of the whole context, but of the of uh, the government agencies, I mean, in fact, it's an area where, you know, I kind of come to it from doing various other types of research, like the SEC. I know a lot about Security and Exchange Commission, not because I studied the Security and Exchange Commission, but because I start looking at these rulings that they make and start trying to understand why did they do this. And one of the things you see is that uh, in the United States, these agencies have a huge amount of power. 
So there may be some cases where, you know, legally, you know, the, you know, the, the, the judiciary is, is coming in, but there's a lot of things like, like, like the rule that allows stock buybacks. It was never vetted in Congress. It was never, uh, you know, uh, you know, contested. Well, now, now it is being contested, but, but, you know, that was the, the Tammy Baldwin uh, senators uh, reward work act, which was the first attempt to really, you know, do something about stock buybacks that came in 2018. The, the law that allowed them or the rule that allowed them, not the law, it was 1982, you know. Uh, so, so I think a lot of these agencies actually get to set the rules and unless uh, they're, they're contested, either uh, through some legal proceeding or in Congress, uh, you know, just they can be doing a lot of damage. Um, doesn't mean they always do damage, but you know these agencies. But they can do a lot of damage if, and particularly if they're driven by uh, 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 ridiculous economic theory. Uh, well, just remind me of the third question. Uh, I think it was Joaquin. No. Yeah, no. My question was about like, is there a limit to buybacks? Oh, yeah, a limit to buybacks. Yeah. Oh, and okay. uh, and linking it to game theory, like it could be yeah. a case of a finite game with only applications we know. So how? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So so so. Uh, uh, I mean, there are there is there is a certain amount of stock reissued to employees, and we started measuring that as a percentage of the buyback. So there there's some that uh, employees exercising options or. Uh, you know, uh, getting stock awards is more stock out on the market through that, or sometimes through merger and acquisition. So, so, so the uh, um, you could end up, you know, without them. Actually, they rarely do public issues except for small biotech companies uh, of stock. So, you, so you tend not to punish it. But yeah, I mean, the, we we've tracked it for some companies, and we see you know, that over a decade, two decades, even three decades, their earning per share is going up and their, and their share count is going down, uh, you know. And so now there's a, you know, uh, I guess if they get, you know, but these companies have hundreds of millions of shares. So I guess if they got down to, you know, uh, uh, you know, 10 shares each worth, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, $100 million or something like that, <laughs> Uh, you know, you could say they're run out of shares, but they're not. They're not anywhere near there. But it's clearly it 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 uh, it inflates the, the value of those shares until. But that that assumes that the company can, in fact, is 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 still able to dominate and distribute. You know, still able to generate the profits every once in a while. It's not the shares that run out. That's the problem. It's the company's hitting the wall because of their financialization. So I could give you lots of examples of companies that, like a Motorola that you know, was a leader in, in mobility in the, in the era when mobility was on the rise, when, it, when it, it, it did buybacks between 2005, 2007, and that was really the end of its really ability to comp compete in, in cell phones. Uh, uh, Blackberry, uh, Research in Motion, uh, the two founders, when they realized that uh, they couldn't compete with Apple in 2010, 2011, when that's when they had to do it, they 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 started doing buybacks uh, and uh, made out for themselves better than they would have otherwise, as they got out of the, sold their shares. Uh, though Nokia, when it was a cell phone company, they they screwed themselves over by doing buybacks. Uh, one of the biggest repurchasers in Europe in the 2010s, 2000s, but. They, they, the, the problem wasn't they ran out of shares. They, they couldn't. They, they ran out of cell phones that anybody wanted to buy, and so it's the innovation side of it that that that, that shows up as the the problem before before they run out of shares. Okay, thank you very much, Bill, for for your for your talk. So we cannot applaud as we we would do. Uh, maybe we can try to. Okay. Thank you very much for, for this discussion. I think that was really rich. Uh, I think we appreciated all uh, much your, your presentation and the discussion. You are invited next year, as you understood, for the, for the seminar in person that time, hopefully. And, um, and see you soon. Take care.
Okay, thank you. Thank and you. and for the students, we stay all together. We take five minutes break, and and in five minutes we we can have a small talk uh, for five ten minutes.